This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns on the child welfare system and the family court system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and next to me is Maria Melin. Maria, what's up today? We would like to welcome you, the viewers, to our television show. Um, there's a lot that we have going on today. Recently, there was three mothers that fled from CPS right here in Michigan. In fact, two of them were from Holland, Michigan. A two-year-old girl who Holland police were trying to find has been voluntarily turned over by the mother to Ottawa County Child Protective Services. Jontasia Hines was dropped off by her mom on Monday afternoon. According to the Holland Department of Public Safety, the little girl is safe and well. Child Protective Services is trying to track down a missing five-year-old from the Battle Creek area. The CPS document shows Haley is believed to be with her mother, Cassandra Ellswick, and her boyfriend. The report shows the couple took Haley and fled the state, and several attempts by CPS to locate them have failed. Holland Public Safety is looking to execute an order by Ottawa County Child Protective Services to take a seven-month-old boy into protective custody. Authorities believe that the welfare of Josiah Williams may be at risk and believe that he is currently with his mother, 32-year-old Sarah Baird of Holland, and perhaps with her boyfriend, 22-year-old Sean Williams, also of Holland. Detectives add that the couple may have left the Tulip City area with the child in order to avoid complying with a court order. The last known location of them is in the South Haven area. Wow, Maria, all this coming in less than a month. Families taken off, running from CPS. CPS had gotten court removals for all three of these children, but what really troubles me, Maria, there was never an Amber Alert issue for any one of these cases. All three of these children are now in the custody of the state. What is it, what is a parent to do? Many of them can't afford a, a good attorney or get one to step up to the plate. Let's take a look at an under, underground network in the UK that operates. Here is an exclusive, exclusive investigation by Channel 4 news team that gains unprecedented access to the underground network which helped families flee from social services over in the UK. Let's take a look at that clip. Now what would you do if you feared social services were going to take away your child? For some families the answer is to leave everything behind and just flee abroad even living on the run. An investigation by this program has uncovered networks of sympathizers who are providing advice, shelter, and sometimes money to help these families flee the country, taking their children with them. Our social affairs editor, Jackie Long, reports. We are in the middle of packing because the social services caught up with us. They are yeah. families turned fugitives. Time's up, come on, you need to get dressed so we can go. Running from the authorities, I just grabbed hold of them and just ran and ran and ran. Taking desperate measures to keep the children social services want to take away. If it gets back to UK social services, all hell will break loose. We were punished for something that we hadn't done. 
This baby is just 10 weeks old, but has been on the run her whole life. She's not alone. We've discovered across Europe, there are scores of British children living as fugitives. In all the cases we've seen, the issue is not a physical harm, but of potential emotional abuse or neglect. A serious charge, and one the parents say is almost impossible to fight. So they choose instead to flee. There have always been parents who fled the country with their children to escape social services. But what's new are the networks of people actually helping them to flee in increasing numbers. But is it ever in the best interests of the children? Or is it potentially putting them at risk? I'm a social worker. How are you? What's your name? This footage was filmed by a British mother in hiding in the Republic of Ireland. And don't be nervous now. She fled there with her four children to escape the involvement of social services. But now the Irish authorities have caught up with them. We'll be in contact because the case conference will happen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Once the social worker leaves, Liz, not her real name, decides it's time to move on again. We are in the middle of packing. There are no current proceedings against her, but she's convinced they will try to take the children. Boys, you've got ten minutes. Come on. They squeeze into the family car and race off, not sure where to. Kids are aboard. And believe it or not, I really question whether we've done the right thing. But I couldn't stand there and wait. That family is not unique. And Ireland seems to be the first port of call for many of these families who are fighting to keep their children. We've come to County Cavan, just south of the Irish border. We've been told that in the past six months alone, seven families on the run from social services in England have passed through here. Sharon, we can't use her real name, arrived in Ireland after fleeing the UK with just days to go before the birth of her baby. Helping her every step of the way was Jenny, an active member of one of the networks. Another parent calls up on the internet for help. Is there any orders on the kids? But this goes way beyond online chat. Jenny, who's had her own children taken away and placed for adoption, agreed to tell us more. Between the groups, there's probably just over a thousand members at least. We can give them advice on where, where's safe, how the laws work in different countries, helping them planning their route. We cannot verify her claims, but Jenny says the stream of families coming through is constant. Yeah, and I think between three to six hundred families in the past year that, that have left from the involvement of social care. Breakfast at a house a few miles away, an everyday family scene with an extraordinary history. This woman, we'll call her Mandy, kidnapped her own son while he was in foster care. I grabbed his shoes and his coat, but I didn't even put them on. I just grabbed hold of him and just ran and ran and ran. She planned it meticulously. With false identities and an untraceable car, she seized her moment. I knew I had to get him and get to the boat straight away, there couldn't be any time elapsed. So I knew that if I got caught, that I would be probably done for kidnap. Mandy actually put her son into care voluntarily after suffering a breakdown. But after struggling to win him back, she said she had no choice but to run. There will be a lot of people who are horrified, who say on the pure basis that you snatched your child away from foster care, that you're not fit to be a mother? Social services have been involved and are still involved with me. Um, they didn't just let me keep him, you know. They're not idiots over here. They do act, um, but it's the way they act that it's completely different. So they took him, they completed their own assessments and decided what was in my son's best interest. And in the end, Irish social services decided Mandy, who since had another baby, can keep both her children. Our investigation discovered a series of informal networks spread across Europe. And in Monaco, at the heart of it all, is this man. This 80-year-old businessman has helped Mandy and hundreds like her to escape the authorities. Here, another plea for help. Think about it and I say your safest bet is North Cyprus. You're 100% safe there, OK? Ian Josephs is not a lawyer nor a social worker. But he has money, and with that, 
the power to change the lives of vulnerable families. Hey, I'm no Bill Gates, but I do pay for pregnant women to escape the country. I get two or three new calls every single day, practically. That doesn't sound too many, but if you multiply it by 365, it comes to quite a lot. I tell people, escape while you have time. An unshakable belief that British social services routinely make the wrong decisions leave him confident he's always helping the right people. I can understand your main concern being, am I meddling in things that I shouldn't and that I know nothing about, sitting in Monaco, helping people in the UK? Well, you know, if you help people, in my mind, you're not, uh, you're not meddling, you really aren't. I feel the social services in Ireland, France, Spain, Italy are much more humane and will deal with the mother uh, in a proper way and won't take her baby for, for uh, past sins or, or spurious reasons. But what if the mothers he helps refuse to engage with the social services in any country? This is the family we met fleeing Ireland. He and Joseph's helped pay when they first left the UK. Now Liz, her husband and the four children are on the run again, this time to southern Europe. We slept in the car last night and we slept in a tent the two nights before that. Though she insists they've done nothing wrong, she says they won't stop running. We're going to have to keep moving. So we really don't have an option. We would like to stay in one place, um, but we have to be careful. As one family's journey begins, many others have already settled abroad. Travelling down into southern Europe, we met up with Julie and Andy. Again, not their real names. We had our baby taken at four days old. We didn't hurt her to have her taken. Julie had suffered from severe depression, and social services assessed she was in danger of emotionally neglecting or abusing her unborn child. They just pressed the nuclear button, didn't they, straight off? We recognise that the child protection system is important, but you can be convicted of, on the potentiality of causing harm or neglect. So like many of the parents we met, they argue they were not given a fair hearing by a system too quick to remove children. And this woman, a leading expert in child welfare and a social worker for 30 years, agrees there is a problem. Well, it's clearly saying that there's something very wrong with the system. If, if the only option people have is to, is to run, then uh, th th there has to be something that needs to be looked at. It's the system that needs to change, not just the one person or one professional body within it. But she's in no doubt that it's the children who are potentially being put at risk. The problem is that within that there are probably going to be some very vulnerable children. And how can we know that they're getting the right help? It's really very worrying. Our journey through Europe investigating these networks brought us back to London to meet a perhaps surprising figure providing advice and assistance to families who fled the country, MP John Hemming. The underlying problem is you really can't rely on getting a fair trial. And if you can't get a fair trial, uh, the only way of protecting the family is to actually go abroad. But you're not talking just about support, for example, to fight a court case here. You are talking about support, which in, in many cases leads to them fleeing. Um, well, it isn't because we don't provide support for somebody to go abroad. What we will do is we'll pay the travel costs of a supporter to go and look after somebody. So if you've got a pregnant woman wandering around the streets of Waterford alone, we might make sure there's somebody with her. But you are still assisting someone who's fled social services? We are assisting people who fled an unjust in, in and improper judicial process, yes. But is that right for an MP to be doing? Well, that's a matter for people to decide. The question is whether, whether the system is working properly or not. In such complex cases, we can't know the rights or wrongs. But while parents feel fleeing is the only option, at best the children involved face a life permanently on the run, or at worst, a life with little or no protection. Uh, underground network, we, we need something like that here in the United States and I want to thank Yai and Josephs for financing this over there in the in the Europe nations.
um, Maria? What I find really troubling, Dennis, about all of this that's taking place is, you know, like you said, these parents are fleeing with their children. I, I strongly believe that if these parents are unfit, if they have been found to abuse or neglect their children, this should be an issue for criminal court, not to come in and just take children away without charging the parents with a crime. And in my mind, that doesn't make sense. Um, if they're doing something that awful that were to require children being removed, there should be criminal charges involved. We happen to run across another article that runs right along with what we've been talking about. And it happens to be going on here in America. So let's go to our newsroom right now. Wendy? Police say a network of family court critics is hiding Rocky sisters. Gianna Rocky and her sister Samantha Rocky were 13 and 14 respectively when they ran away from their Lakeville home on April 19, 2013. Lakeville Police Lieutenant Jason Polinski assumed that as his agency searched for missing teenagers Gianna and Samantha Rocky, the people who saw them last would be willing to help. Instead, he said, those people have resisted in hopes that the girls stay missing. Every person we've talked to had the same anti-government, family court sucks attitude, Polinsky said. Polinsky was referring to a vocal, passionate group, both in Minnesota and nationwide, that is sometimes called the protective parent movement. Those in the movement believe that family courts are broken, and judges in custody disputes are ordering children to live with abusive parents. Some in the group say the non-custodial parent in these cases has no choice but to hide kids in a loosely organized underground network. There are networks, little pockets throughout the country of abuse survivors who have dug in their heels and are forming an ad hoc shelter, refuge for children. And said Amy Newstein, a socialist in New Jersey who has studied the underground and become a critic of family courts after losing custody of her daughter. People in the underground naturally say, stay silent about their involvement. It's not known who operates the homes, how many children they take in, or if they are as prominent as they were three decades ago, when its leader gained national notoriety. Still, Polinsky suspects it's this network that is hiding the girls who were 13 and 14 when they ran away from their Lakeville home on April 19, 2013. So far, Lakeville police have searched three homes of people believed to have helped the girls disappear. There's no way you hide two people that long by yourself, Polinsky said. The act of keeping actual human beings missing is too hard to do. Before their disappearance, the sisters told the judge in their parents' divorce case that they were being abused by their father, David Rucky. After they ran away, they appeared on a local news station to repeat those claims and said they wanted to live with their mother, Sandra Gazzini Rucky. However, a psychologist said the girls needed to be deprogrammed after describing the girls as being brainwashed by their mother to hate their father. In November 2013, a family court judge granted full custody to the father after finding there was no credible evidence that he abused his daughters and Rucky denies ever mistreating his children. Grazini Rucky herself had been missing since August when she was charged with three felony counts of deprivation of parental rights and a warrant issued for her arrest. United States Marshals found her October 18 at an Orlando area resort. She has agreed to be extradited to Minnesota. Polinsky said she has not provided authorities with any information that would help find the girls. Grazini Rucky's attorneys Michelle McDonald said her client had nothing to do with their disappearance and does not know where they are now. Still, McDonald said her client does not want police to find the girls, fearing they will be forced into unwanted therapy and eventually have to live with their father. What are they coming back to? What protection will they have, McDonald said. They're free right now. New lives. The underground came to public attention in the 1980s when Faye Yeager became the face of the movement 
while running it from her Atlanta home. Years earlier, Yeager was thrown in jail after she accused a former husband of molesting their daughter. She was one of the few willing to speak publicly about the underground, giving interviews to the media and appearing on talk shows. That publicity led to Yeager being charged with kidnapping in 1992. Though Yeager was acquitted, Newstein said those, do those charges effectively silenced anyone who knew about the underground and for a time all but dissolved it. But she said the network remained active and is now accessed by parents through social media, women's shelters, and churches. Yeager now runs a bed and breakfast in Brevard, North Carolina, but she told the Star Tribune last week that she is still involved in the underground and has helped to hide hundreds of children. She said before children go into hiding, they often work with planners months in advance. Once they run, they are often given new names and identification cards. They are then relocated to what Yeager said were hundreds of sympathetic families both in and out of the country. As for how the two teenagers can be kept off social media, Yeager said it's not difficult. You tell them how the real world is. I tell them you're welcome to do those things, Yeager said, but these are consequences. Of the Rucky girls, she said, I hope they go on missing. Asked if she knew anything about their case, she replied, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. In an interview with Star Tribune in April, Grazini Rucky said she had no idea where Samantha and Gianna were. Newstein said that's likely true. If a mother really wants to protect her children and she doesn't want anyone to know where they are, she'd be crazy to make a phone call, said Newstein. Wouldn't a mother want to know how her children were doing while underground? What happened to the children into the Holocaust when they were hidden, Newstein re replied. Did the Jewish parents have contact with their children in the Holocaust? Or were they or were they concerned that if they made contact, the Germans would find their children? Do not turn them in. When her, turn, when her teenage son went into the underground in 2011, after accusing his father of abuse, Cindy Dumas of San Diego said she didn't want to know where he was. Her son, now 19, is no longer in hiding. She said she knew he was safe with other parents she could trust because they also lost custody of their children. These are the parents we trust the most, Dumas said. In a Facebook post about the Rocky sisters in April, Dumas advised, sisters still underground, if you see them, do not turn them in. Dumas told the Star Tribune she, was a reli she has reliable sources who have told her that the girls are underground and safe, but denied any involvement in hiding them. The kids that I know that have been fortunate enough to get into hiding are being taken care of very well. She said, they're not like kids out on the streets. Police have no idea how the girls are doing, Polinsky said, last seeing them when they appeared on the May 2013 news broadcast. Polinsky suspects it was initially a local network that arranged that interview and hid the Rocky girls. Since August, Lakeville police have served search warrants on three people. They have called people of interest in the case. Michael Reedon, a friend of Grazini Rucky's, Dale Nathan, a suspended attorney and critic of family courts, and Dee Dee Evavold, a campaign manager of Michelle McDonnell and supporter of the protective parent movement. Those searches have uncovered evidence suggesting the girls are now being hidden by a national network, Polinsky said. Nathan said he was with Grazini Rucky when the girls ran from their home into her car, but denies helping to hide them. In an interview Monday, Eva Vold denied any involvement in the girls' disappearance. Raiden could not be reached for the story. McDonald, who has also been named by Lakeville Police as person of interest in the case, called the search warrants tyranny and a form of terrorism. Regarding the whereabouts of the girls, she said it's possible they are underground. The underground system right here in the U.S. Parents must do what they need to do to protect their children. Our family court system sure isn't protecting them and do not have their best interest in mind. We will be back after these messages.
Now let's check out this word from Legally Kidnapped. My attorney won't do anything to help with my case. My lawyer won't even return my phone calls. Good evening. I'm Baby LK. If you are innocent of CPS allegations and your attorney isn't doing his job or has told you to just do what they want to get your children back, has advised you to submit to guilt of the allegations, or has not suggested a trial, that is a red flag that your attorney is indifferent to your case. You have the right to make your attorney work for you by letting him know that you expect his best defense. You should make sure that he is knowledgeable about child protection law and CPS policy and procedures. You should agree to use email for communication communication to save time and set a reasonable schedule to review your case, for example, twice a month. In the meantime, you need to help your lawyer do his job. Create a list of questions and issues for your next conference. Send them to him in one email, unless, of course, you have an urgent matter to contend with. If you aren't a part of the attorney-client team, don't expect anything but for him to take the easy road by doing nothing. And every state has an online attorney complaint board, and if your attorney is not cooperative, it's time to ask him to withdraw and file a complaint to the state bar. Always remember that if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. And until next time, this is Baby LK, over and out. I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference.